All right, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 3. I'm doing a little stage set up here. John chapter 3. We're going to be in uh, the first 21 verses there. Thankful to uh, Jeff and our worship team. They do an awesome job each week. And it's easy to, to come up and, and speak after something, something like that. And I'm just thankful that we're allowed to come into his presence every Sunday. And those guys help us do that. So John chapter 3, we're in, the, we're in a, a series. Those of you who this is your first time with us, we're in a series in the book of John. And we're, we're going through the, uh, the whole book. Where it's not a verse by verse. It's more kind of chapter by chapter. And, and so we're, we're right in the middle of that. And we're, uh, we're, we're kicking off John chapter 3. Next week, uh, we're going to be in uh, John chapter 4. Surprise, surprise. Um, and next week will be a little bit unique because there's going to be uh, two of us up here. Chad's going to be going to be speaking, and, and, and I'll be speaking too. Don't worry, it's not going to be longer. I already know you're, you're already planning not to be here next week. Um, no, but it, it, it'll be good, and, and I hope you'll be a part of that. But uh, we're here in John chapter 3, and a, an interesting conversation that he has uh, with Nicodemus. But I, I know today is Mother's Day, and, and we've talked about that. I, I, my, like I said, my mom's here. I love my mom. thankful for my mom. And um, but, but I, I want to talk about my dad just for a second, um, because my dad, he is a, uh, he is Mr., he's kind of like a Mr. Fix-It. He can, he can make anything, or it seems like he, he can fix anything, build anything. Um, I, know there, I know there are things that he can't do, and, and definitely there are things that he won't do, but, but compared to me, the, when it comes to this, this project's world, compared to me, he's a genius, and honestly, anyone compared to me is a genius, but I mean, that's, that's a different thing. But, but he's, he's just good with projects, and, and I wish I could do half of what he does. Um, I, I don't really know where I was growing up when he was busy doing things like that. I'm sure I, I'm sure I was in front of the TV or, or really trying to avoid any kind of thing that he was doing because it, it wasn't fun. But I, I look back at that, and I wish sometimes that, that I would have kind of made myself available uh, to, to be with him, to help him, to learn. I mean, he's taught me some things, no, no doubt, but there, there, there's just, I, I wish I would have taken the time so I could know how to do what he does. Um, and, but I just, I can't, I can't, I'm not a project guy, I can't fix things. When something, when there's a project that needs to be done or something's broken in the home, you know, he, he goes after it and he takes care of it. Me, I'm like, hello, yes, can you, <laughs> I call someone, that's just me. Uh, I'm not good at those things. My wife is actually, she's even pretty good at those. She's better than me. R really, I don't know what value I bring to my family. So, I mean, it's just, I'm just, I'm just it's just me. So here I am. Uh, I eat. That's what I do. To our, that's what I do to our family. But, you know, I, I was thinking about it. We, we kind of pride ourselves um, on being pretty self-sufficient. Right? We, we, we live in a DIY world. It's it's do-it-yourself world. And I, it's, it's kind of this whole, I've got things under control type of people. Especially in this community that, that we live in. Um, Allen and, and Plano, Frisco, McKinney, kind of this whole North Texas area. Um, there, there, is, there is this attitude, it's, it's kind of pervasive through everything, that says, I'll take care of things myself. Um, I got this. I, I, I can handle this. It's, it's, it's not, it, no big deal. But, but especially, though, when it comes to, to things of God, um, we kind of have this attitude sometimes of, I don't really need God. My, my life is good. Uh, my, my job is good. I've, I've got enough money. Sure would be nice to have more, but, but I'm okay. My family's good. I've got good health care insurance. I work hard and on and on and on and on and on. And, and we live in a very self-sufficient world. And I, I know nobody really in here is what, what we might describe as desperate. Now, I, I know that's not everyone's reality, but a majority of what we see in our community, um, it, this is what we see in this area. And, and that's good. Now, hear me say, that's good, but that's, that's also bad. It's good because we are, we are doing okay. We are blessed. You know, none of us are going hungry. If we're hungry, we go to the refrigerator. Or we go over to McDonald's. If we're sick, we, we'll go to the doctor. We don't have to hope that we just get better. There, there's medicine. There's people that we can go to. Uh, we have homes. We have stuff. We're not really in need, and, and that's a good thing, but that's bad too. And what I mean by that is this, this, outward, this outward stuff kind of lulls us into a uh, false sense of security. Like as long as things are going well out here, then, then I'm okay. But the, the reality is, is the outward stuff 
does nothing for the inward issues that we have. It, it doesn't address, actually, it doesn't address our greatest need. And let me, let me put this up here for you. So we have this, our sin. And then we have, whoop, there goes my notes. We have a perfect God. And this, this is our greatest need, is that we are, we are sinners who are separate because of our sin, because of, because of us choosing our own way over God's way, because of this reality, then we are separated from a perfect God. Because I want, in case you don't know this, sin and God, they don't mix. They don't mesh. There's, there's no way that those, those two things can go together. And this this, despite what, what, what everyone else in the world might say, this, this is our greatest need. And our stuff, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fix this. And so we're, we're going to take a look. And let's read in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. It says this. Uh, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him. This is it's talking about he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi... We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can anyone be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be? Nicodemus asked. Are you a, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied. Truly I tell you, you we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is talking about himself there. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and the only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness, think sin, People love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. So there's a, uh, a whole lot there. And, and we don't have a lot of time to get into a lot of it, but I, we're going to... We're going to talk about some of it real quick. And, and some of the things that I want you to know, we we're introduced to a, to, to a person that Jesus is having a conversation with, and his name is Nicodemus. And this is, this is a guy who's, who's serious about his religion. He is, he is a Pharisee, and, and Pharisees, if you, don't, if you don't know, if you didn't grow up in church or grow up reading your Bible, that's okay. But I just kind of want to introduce you to a little bit about a, what a Pharisee is. They, they are super intense about obeying God's law. They were serious about the commands uh, of God that were laid out in the Old Testament. You see, Judaism teaches that, that the Old Testament has 613 commandments. There are 248 do's, things that, that you should do, and there's 365 don'ts. In other words... Do these, don't do this. So, and, and at this time, there were about uh, 6,000 Pharisees, and they were all committed to doing every single command. You took a pledge, matter of fact. When you became a Pharisee, um, a scholars tell us that you would take a pledge in front of three, three other, three other uh, religious leaders to say that you were going to obey all the commands. And what is crazy was is that they were so committed to, to, to obeying these laws that they created more laws, not so 613 weren't enough. So what they said is we're going to create more laws on top of these laws just to make sure that we don't get close to obeying the original 613. 
So we're going to create more. See, they thought the key to being in good standing with God meant that you have to do, you have to do everything right. You have to do everything perfect. So this is, this is Nicodemus, and this is his background, where he's coming from. So you know when he's coming to see Jesus. And he's also referred to as a ruler of the Jews, which means he was most likely a part of the, of, of the Sanhedrin. And, and the Sanhedrin, it's made up of, of 70 leaders who are basically, they're, they're the governing body of the nation of Israel. You, you think, to kind of put it in our terms today, think of, uh, of, the, US, of, of the Senate and the Supreme Court kind of all rolled up into one body. Well, that's, that's what the Sanhedrin was. So this guy, he's, he's sort of a mini celebrity. He's, he's super religious. He's very powerful. He's a teacher of Israel. That's what Jesus called him. Jesus said, you're, so you're a teacher of Israel, which means that he knows a lot about the Scripture. As a matter of fact, he's probably got large chunks of it, if not all of it, memorized. Okay, so in today's world, he would, he would be highly respected, most likely very wealthy. He has it all together. And here comes Nicodemus coming to talk to Jesus. And I, I don't know if he's driven by, just by curiosity, uh, because he said, he said, you know, no one can do what you do, God, those mir- or Jesus, those miracles, unless God is with. So I don't know, it's just curious, he wants to learn more about Jesus, or if he's, he's driven to Jesus by this sense of duty, I'm a Pharisee, I'm a religious leader, so I need to, I need to check you out. I need to make sure that you, what you're doing, where is all this coming from? Or if he's driven by this sense of something inward, that he needs something that Jesus has. But he comes to him, and it's interesting what Jesus immediately tells him. And the first thing that Jesus tells him is he says is that your credentials, Nicodemus, aren't enough. Your credentials aren't enough. Jesus knew who Nicodemus was, and Jesus knew his impressive resume. But Jesus cuts right to the issue and tells Nicodemus that unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And it's funny, Nicodemus doesn't even ask him that. He just, he just says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who comes from God, for no one can form, perform these signs with you unless God is with you. So he's not asking, how do I see the kingdom of God? He's not asking, what do I need to do to get into the kingdom of God? But that's immediately where Jesus goes, and he says, unless you were born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And I think this is a mistake that a lot of, a lot of us that we make. I talked about this. We think we can fix. We think we can fix this. Let me make sure I'm pointing to the right thing. Yes, it's our sin. Uh, I forgot where I put it. I, we, we, we think that we can fix this. We think that, that we, we, we can be good enough or, or that we, we, we do enough good stuff. We think that because, because I go to church, because I'm here, yeah, that, that fixes that. Or we think, well, I grew up in church. I've been going to church all my life. That fixes it. Or I grew up in a, in a Christian home. I had Christian parents or Christian grandparents or whatever. We think that that fixes, fixes that. Or my spouse is a Christian. Or, or I, think, I think God is, is that's, that's a good thing. And we think that, that we can fix that. But here's the deal. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how many times you've been in here uh, to church or you've gone to church ever in your life. It doesn't matter if, if you've got this, this whole thing memorized. Um, none of that will fix this. The only thing that will fix this is Jesus. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you see that, that term, fall short, and you, what, basically what that means is that none of it, we are not worthy we are not worthy. It means that, that we've broken this relationship. You see, we used to be here. We, we, we were created to be here, but because of our sin, we've broken that relationship, and now, now we're separated. And this falling short, is, it's a continuous thing. It's not something that, it's, it just means that every, every time we try, we fall short. We keep falling short on our own, by our own efforts. We, we keep missing the mark. There is this goal that we're, supposed to, that we're supposed to reach, and we can't be, because we keep failing in our attempts. Uh, imagine if, if I tried to jump up there to touch that ceiling. Not going to happen, right? It's just not. It doesn't matter how much I train, you know, it, it, how much weight I shed or whatever. It's, it's physically impossible for me to get up there to be able to jump and touch that. There's no way I can do it. I would fall short. Every time, unless something or someone assisted me, helped me to do that on my own, 
that's going to be impossible. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, not by works so that no one can boast. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we've done, but because of His own compassion and mercy by the cleansing of the new birth. Remember Jesus said you got to be born again? He saw that's Nicodemus. By the cleansing of the new birth, spiritual transformation, regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So I, I hope you're, you're getting the idea here that it's, it's not our credentials. It's, it's God's work through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that, that works to make us, make us new. We can't, we can't be good enough. That speaks to, to this whole idea of our self-sufficiency. But, but I think it also speaks to this, this idea for some of us about our self-negativity. There, there are some of you who, who are very much the opposite of, of self-confident, and, and I would say that some of you live in this, maybe just this self, this sense of shame. And, and for, me, for me saying you're not good enough, you, you might respond to me, go, hey, well, thanks for rubbing it in, Jimmy. Um, I know I'm not good enough. I have no problem believing that. I'm, I'm a professional at beating myself up. I know I'm no good. I know I'm not worthy. How could, how could anyone love me? And to that, I, I, if that's your reality today, what I would say to you there is the same thing I would say to, to everyone who's, who would say that, that I can take care of them myself, that I can fix it. Here's what I would say. It's not based on you. It's not based on you. We don't earn God's love. We don't work for God's love. What we do in our lives, it doesn't change his love for us. We can't make him love us more, and we can't make him love us less. So really, if you think about it, the pressure is off. You don't have to perform. You just, you just have to surrender. Our credentials, whether you think yours are, are super impressive, like... Uh, I'm a really good person. I give a lot of money. I'm here at church every day. Um, I, I, I do this. I do this. If you think your, your, your credentials are impressive or you would say, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. I, I would say that, that all of those things are not enough. Our credentials don't fix the issue. And he, here's, here's the next thing is, is that God would tell us, and what he told Nicodemus, and I think what he would say to us is, God does more than just cleaning us up. He does more than clean you up. What he does is, he makes you brand new. Our world is obsessed. We're, we're obsessed with self-improvement. Self there, there's, there's whole sections in bookstores. I don't know if you guys still go to bookstores. I know Amazon online is taken. But if you go to a bookstore, um, there, there's whole sections dedicated to this whole idea of self-improvement. If you do a Google search, if you do, did one right now on your phone, um, I did one yesterday. It comes back with about 25,900,000 hits when you, when you Google search self-improvement. We're looking, we're, we're looking to make ourselves better. We want to be smarter. We want to be healthier. We would like to have more money. We want to be more whatever. You, you fill in the blank. And, and, and improvement is okay, but, but I don't want you to, I don't want you to, to, to confuse improvement, self-improvement, with the gospel. The, the gospel is not about making you better. The gospel is about making you brand new. You see the difference? We, we, don't need a better, we don't need a better version of you and me. We need a new you and a new me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a better creation. No, it doesn't say it, does it? It says he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Being born again is, is total transformation from the inside out. Following all the external laws that Nicodemus was doing, uh, that, that would never be enough. What we all need is an internal transformation. The idea is not to improve on this, but the idea is to change this, to change you and me. It's not about being better, but it's about being different. A different you and me that comes through the transforming work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 says, but that's no lie for you. You learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth, precisely as we have, 
as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life, it has to go. Notice he didn't say it has to get better or we need to improve on that. He says the old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it and then take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself out into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. You see the theme in that verse? You see the motion in that verse? It's not about fixing what's old. It's not about making it better. It's about change, and the change comes from within, and the change from within then affects who you are as you live your life. It's easy to fall into that trap of just kind of fixing the outside. Fixing the, the external. That's easier. But, but, what, but inward change is really what transfers, transforms somebody. In counseling, um, if, if you've ever gone to any counseling, one of the, sometimes one of the main goals is not just to focus on, on behavior modification. In other words, changing the things that you do. You can change behaviors, and, and, but that's not always really lasting change. It's not about behavior modifications. Really what, what the work is, it's about changing your beliefs, changing how you think, because beliefs change behaviors. Inside transformation changes everything. When your beliefs change, then, then you start to see things differently. You respond and you react differently. Your whole perspective changes, and God wants to, he wants to change our whole perspective. He wants our old way of living, our old way of thinking, our old way of seeing life to be completely transform. Galatians 6, 15 says, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. Okay, that's outward, outward, an outward uh, solution to an inward problem. That doesn't matter. What counts is whether we have been transformed, changed into a new creation. But here's the struggle with this for some of us. We would say, why, why do I need to change? I'm, I'm really not that bad. I mean, comparatively speaking, I haven't murdered anyone, I haven't stole anything, I've, I've, I've not taken anyone else's spouse, I've got my own stuff, I, I, I give to the poor, I go to church, uh, I'm, I'm nice to, to, to senior adults, I, I, I don't kick the dog when I leave the house, and I didn't run over the cat that I saw this morning. I, you know, I'm, 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 what is it about me that needs to change? I'm, I'm a pretty good person. But see, Here's the deal. God, notice this, perfect God, well, that's his standard. Perfection. Another way to say that is holiness. That's his standard. And I hear you saying, well, good luck with that, Jimbo, because nobody's perfect. And my response to you would be, exactly. You're exactly right. That's why a better you and me, uh, an improved you and me, that's why that won't cut it. Better, better means we're still not perfect. It has to be a new you and me. And the new happens through God and his work in us. And here's, here's how you know when the new has happened. This, don't miss this. The new will be evident when you believe in Jesus. It's not, it's not that you respect Jesus a lot or that you have a, a really good opinion of Jesus or, or you know, that was, he, he's a really good guy, but it's, it's, it's faith, it's belief in who Jesus says he is and belief in what he has done for us, what he's done for you and me. That's the evidence of the new life and how you respond to that. And here's, here's, a, here's a great thing. This is really good news. Is Love for you and for me was the motivation. Love for you was the motivation. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us, it, for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 1 John 3.16. A lot of us know John 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one only son. 1 John 3, 16 says, This is how we have come to know love, that he laid down his life for us. Now, I don't know what your picture of God is. So when I, when I say, okay, think about God, what, what is your picture? For some of you, it, it might be, well, he's, he's angry, or he's this, this guy with a long white beard and this cane and, or this staff and sitting up in heaven. You might think of God as, as this big party pooper. He wants, to, he wants to kill everyone's fun. He might be distant. He's uncaring. He's, he's unplugged from society. He doesn't really get what's going on. But what I don't want you to miss is, is in those three scriptures, those are just three, three of tons of examples of God's love. Listen to this. He did what he did because he loves you and me. I mean, just let that sink in for that, for just a second. The God of the universe, the God, the, the creator of all, who spoke, spoke things into being, the God who, who's able to raise people from the dead, the God who is in control of everything. The sun came up because of God, all right? We, we're breathing because of God. Everything that's happening is, that, that's good in our lives, it's because of God. Okay, that God loves you. Someone, you may not have heard that before. You may not have heard anyone say, I love you in a long, long, long time. But here's what you want you to know. God loves you, and we know we know of his love because of what he, he's done. We know love because God showed us what love looked like. He modeled it. He demonstrated it. He didn't just talk about it, but, but he did it. He did what we couldn't do. We couldn't, we couldn't fix this. We can't fix this. But, but God, he took care of it. And matter of fact, the opposite of love the opposite of love would have been to leave us right here with no hope or no way out of this situation. That would have been the opposite of love. And in, in, if you still have your Bibles open, there's this small word in, in John, in there in John chapter 3, verse 16, and it's the word for. It's a real just three-letter word, but it, it's an important word because it lets you know that verse 16 is connected to verse 14 and 15. Jesus said that he must be lifted up. And what he's referring to there is that he must be lifted up in death. Now, why would Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect Son of God, Jesus is God in, in, in human form, why would the Son of God need to die? Well, he needed to die because he loved us. The horrible crucifixion of the Son of God is a direct result of the love that God has for you and for me. One of, one of commentary I read said, put it this way, God's love is chiefly displayed through the death of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, okay? Why did he have to die? Because he loved you and me. That's why Jesus sent his son. Verse 17 there in chapter three, it says that, that Jesus didn't send, see a lot of people think this is why God sent Jesus, to condemn us. To say, you're bad, you're bad, you're horrible, you're no good, you're, you're going you're gonna to die, you're going you're gonna to go straight to hell. You know, all this stuff. That's why they think Jesus was here. But Jesus, God says, I didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn us. Here's the deal. We were already condemned. We were already condemned. This right here, our sin, when we chose to ignore a perfect God, when we choose to do our own thing, when we choose to place ourselves in God's rightful place, in our lives, when we choose to live for me instead of live for him, guess what? That sin, it already condemns us. So Jesus didn't come to, to, to kind of just throw more, more gas on the fire. No, he came to rescue us. He wasn't coming to do that. He was coming to rescue us. I don't know if any of you guys watched uh, this past week. Was it this past week? I think it was this past week. Anyway, um, Google's annual developers conference. You can, you can go online and just Google, Google's annual developer conference. And what a big part of that is they, they kind of un unveil uh, to the world, or at least to these developers that are there, and, and then to literally the world, all the things that, that they've been working on and all the things that are coming out. And it's fascinating. It's crazy what's, what, what they're doing. I mean, there's, there's this one thing that, that I was just mesmerized by is, is now you can, there's a Google Assistant, and now you can... This Google Assistant will actually call 
somebody for you. And this is all a computer, but it will call for you and it will respond for you and it will talk like a human being and it will say, you know, hello, uh, I, I'm calling on behalf of Jimmy and he would, like to, he would like to schedule a tea time. Well, what would you like for it? Well, uh, just something in, in between the hours of 8 a.m. I mean, it's talking like it's a real, and it's responding. And so the, the things that are coming out are just amazing. And, and it's a little bit scary, too. It's like, okay, computers are going to rule the world, and they're going to destroy us one day. But anyway, but, but it's, I, I, and I watch that, and I just think, man, what has changed over the years? Some of you have, have been around for, for a while. I mean, I've, just, I've been around just for, for 44, fixed to be 45 years. And I just think about in the last 45 years, what has changed just since I've been here. And how, how we've progressed, all the things that we do. And I'm so thankful for that. One of the things that I, that I heard that always just blows my mind is that, that um, scientists say that there's more computer power or, or computer processing in our phone than NASA had in all of its computers when they first started sending people to the moon. Think about that. We have more computer power. If me, there's my phone. We have more, more computer power in this than all of NASA had when they started sending people in the moon that's mind-blowing look how far we've come but here's the deal we're still no to this day we're still no closer to solving this dilemma on our own think about it all the medicines all the 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 diseases that we have cures for now think of all the technology that's out there think of everything as far as we've come but on our own we still haven't developed a way how to fix this and guess what we won't. See, the deal is, is we, we, are, we are drowning in a sea of sin, and we needed someone to come and rescue us. We try to fix it. We try. Gosh, we try. Because you know what? We are DIY. Do it yourself. We're, we are pick yourself up by your bootstraps. We're, we're going to make this happen. So it, it's got to be, if I make enough money, or if I'm, if I'm religious enough, or, I'm, or if I'm kind enough, maybe it's the right relationship, or maybe if I do this or I do that, but, but it doesn't fix the problem. And God sent his son into the world. That's why, because he loved us. We couldn't do it, and we've established that already. So God, God had to do it. The perfect God had to step right into the middle of the sinful world to take care of this. It had to be a son. It had to be Jesus. You see, in Jesus, and Jesus is talking here, and in verse 14, he, he references an event that's actually, it, it, it's, it happened in the book of Numbers back in the Old Testament. The, the Israelites, who, who'd been freed from slavery, remember they were years and years and years and years and years of bondage, of slavery in Egypt, and, and they were released. God, through, through Moses, released his people. But they started complaining. Started complaining about the food, started complaining about they didn't have enough this, enough that. And basically said, well, why did you bring us out? Why did you free us just so we could come out here and die? And so God, God responds to their complaining by sending poisonous snakes to just to start biting the people. And these bites, this venom, what it does is it, it will bring death. But so this starts happening and, and the people realize, wait a minute, okay, we're, we're idiots, we're morons, that God has, God has been faithful. He's, he's done miracle after miracle for us. He, okay, well, God, we, we repent. We're sorry. And so what, what God tells Moses is, is to make an image of the staff and make an image a, a, of a snake and mount it up on a pole. And he says, everyone who looks at that pole, they'll live. They'll live. The, the bite won't kill them. So there was really, so there was only one way, one way, for people who had the venom running through their veins. They could try anything else, you know, they, they could try whatever they could, but there was going to be only one way to keep that venom that was running through their veins from killing them. And that's what Jesus references here when he says, we are the, well, there's only one hope for the sin that's running through our veins, that's coursing through our veins, that's literally killing us. There's only one hope, and that's through Jesus who was lifted up on the cross for us. Eternal life and eternal death hang in the balance. And God wants us to have that eternal life. And here's the deal. All of that, all of that done for you. A perfect God, a perfect God comes in and he covers our sin. Takes care of it. All of that just for you. 
and how we respond to God is up to us. How we respond to that gift, how we respond to that sacrifice, how we respond to that call, it's completely up to us. John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. What a promise. What a promise. Belief means that we have the right to be his children. And everything that comes with that, with being his children, to, and we, we are no longer guilty of our sin. Our sin has been taken care of. Our sin has been covered. It's, it, it's been removed. It can no longer be used against us. First John 1 John 1.9 says, But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. Don't miss that word, if. 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 That's a huge word. If your response is to confess and to believe, then you see the promise. You see the forgiveness. You see the cleansing. God's going to honor your choice, whatever it is. Romans 2, 6 through 8 says, He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. One commentary said it this way, people will face the consequences of their sin not because God's gift of Jesus was insufficient, but because they refused to turn from their sin and trust in Jesus to save them from sin's penalty. We have this great and incredible gift that God has done. He's given us the, the he solved the problem. We couldn't, we couldn't do it on our own. We couldn't do it on our own. It, it's not about making us better. It's about making us new. And he did it because he loves us. And it's all right there. And it's up to us. I want to show you a quick video of some people who, who chose to follow Christ. And I want you to listen. Listen to the difference in their life. The difference that Jesus made. There was a time in my life when I was surrounded by question marks, uncertainties, just a whirlpool of them. There was a time in my life when I was rebellious and anxious. There was a time in my life when I just really lacked purpose. There was a time in my life when I was selfish and self-centered. There was a time in my life when I was hopeless and depressed. There was a time in my life when I had a lot of fear and doubt. There was a time in my life when I didn't have hope and I was aimless. There was a time in my life when I was wandering, lost, and afraid. There was a time in my life when I was very angry and felt totally alone. There was a time in my life when I was broken and selfish. There was a time in my life when I was afraid to read the Bible, and I thought being a Christian would be boring. But because Jesus Christ came into my life, now I have peace and I have a mission. And I am so happy, joy, and he gave me peace. And I can tell the world what he had done for me. I found the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Then I met Jesus, and I now have courage and peace. But then a light came into my life named Jesus. And then I learned of the love of Jesus Christ. And now I'm found in forgiving. Christ came and just really revealed himself to me. And I found out by reading the scriptures uh, that Jesus Christ offered me love and forgiveness. And when I surrendered my life to him, uh, I did receive the love and forgiveness, and the bonus was eternal security with God. But then I learned of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and I surrendered my life to Him, and now I have joy and I have hope. And then I learned about God's love and forgiveness, and now I have hope and a purpose. Do you have a story like that? 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 There was a time in my life when I felt guilty and separated from God. But I learned that there was forgiveness and acceptance in Jesus, and I believed in Him and surrendered to Him, and God gave me peace and a purpose and a place in His family. Do you have a story like that? Do you have a story like that? There was a time in my life when I was anxious and when I really just didn't, didn't have any, any sense of direction, but, but because of the love of Jesus Christ now, I have peace and I have a mission. Do you have a story like that? What's keeping you from putting your faith completely and totally in Jesus Christ? What's keeping you from saying yes to this? Because remember, we can't fix a problem on our own. 
Remember, it's not about being better. It's about being new. Remember, God did it because he loved us. And now, the ball's in your court. What are you going to do with Jesus?